Hello, welcome to the Shift Control Podcast. Um, my name is Paul McAnallan. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk today about the law of the instrument or the law of the hammer. Um, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure, um, for the person with the hammer, everything looks like a nail. And it's dated back to uh, Abraham Maslow. And he's kind of given a little bit of credit for it, but it predates Maslow by maybe 150 years. It was a phrase that emanated in England in the kind of the uh, heavy industrial era. Um, it was called the Birmingham screwdriver, which is essentially a hammer. And um, it's a cognitive bias where um, you basically treat everything um, As if you got a hammer, okay. So, I want to talk about that in the context of selling and sales and building relationships. I want to talk about it in the context of um, the buyer and seller relationship. And for many people, the hammer for years was features and benefits plus questioning. Okay, so. We all know what features and benefits are and um, effective selling. It's probably important to have an idea of what you're selling and have some product and service intelligence and know where that sits against the competition in the marketplace. But if you're only to talk about features and benefits and if you're only to um, ask questions in a very, very methodical fashion, then what you do is you remove emotion completely from the buyer-seller relationship and buying is really all about emotional check-in. It's about being able to tap into the emotions or at least understand um, the motivations of the buyer. So when you talk about position and interest, you talk about the buyer's position um, is no, I don't want to buy, but what you're really trying to target is the interests, because the interests will really inform the position. The interests are why they want to buy or why they're not sure or why they say no. Okay. And so what, what I've seen recently, I've seen for, from a lot of um, businesses and clients that, I, that I'm currently working with, customers that I'm working with, um, they have a fairly process-driven um, sales template where they target specific buyers. They know their target audience, they know um, what they're trying to sell into those kind of segments or personas or cohorts. And it still revolves around features and benefits plus questions. I remember working in a media organization and one of the managers came out to us one day and said, you guys just simply aren't asking the right questions. You know, figures were maybe, um, let's say they, they wouldn't have been up for her to say that. So so the figures were down and, and this lady comes out and says, you're not asking the right questions. And I was always dumbfounded by that statement because nobody had ever really explained what the right questions are. And so in the context of selling and buying, you've got the prospect or customer here and you've got yourself here as two pieces of a jigsaw. And what you're trying to do is fill in the picture. Okay, so you, you ask, questions uh, to find out fact-based detail or to find out um, to try and stimulate a conversation to build a relationship and to try and find out what has motivated the buyer to be in the position that they're in. Yes, I'm interested. No, I'm not interested or um, I'm not sure and so on. Okay. Um, and that's okay. And, and for many people, that's just simply a numbers game and they will go through the numbers and they'll keep on asking those questions. And they're probably trying um, more to qualify prospects in than disqualify prospects because there's always a really refreshing part of the sales process where you're able to say confidently to a prospect that we aren't for you. And um, there's not as much focus on that as there should be, but that's a personal opinion. Maybe talk about that later. These podcasts are all about sales skills and trying to develop better uh, sales performance amongst salespeople, sales managers, um, sales directors, uh, business owners, and so on and so forth, okay? And this is a really fundamental thing, I think, where people will um, 
talk about questions and have a list of questions to ask. I do it myself when I'm coaching people. But one of the things that's really m missed is what selling is really all about, and that's trying to see the picture in the other person's head. It's trying to get an idea of who they are as a person. Um, and this is regardless of the <clears throat> item price or the ticket price and what you're trying to sell, whether it's a product or a service, whether you're selling one or you're selling multi-millions. It's always important to try and get a good steer of what the picture is in the other person's head. And with that in mind, I'm going to talk briefly about emotional intelligence and I'm going to take a little bit of a, a tangent, um, as I probably want to do. But if you think about that one phrase about seeing the picture in the other person's head, and it's something that has been brought to me by a couple of clients that are um, very mature clients, um, very mature in the sense of that, they're, okay, they're older, um, but the experience they have in um, operating in a buoyant market and operating in a restricted market um, through recessions, through the current climate, through failure and so forth is really unrivaled. They operate fairly significant organisations and they boil it down to one thing is trying to see the picture in the other person's head. And so whether that's trying to motivate a salesperson, whether that is trying to um, persuade a prospect to become a customer, what is the picture in the other person's head? What are the motivators? What is their why? And emotional intelligence plays a really big part in the role of any relationship. It's, you know, your understanding of your own emotions, being able to regulate your own emotions, to know whenever you're um, on a high or you're on a low and how you can navigate your way out of that and the impact that that will have on the relationships with others. It's also um, a good way to motivate yourself. And I'll come on to all that in, in a second or two, but at no stage in my professional career, did anybody tell me about that? Did anybody um, tell me about some of the um, really, really impactful ingredients for sales? It was all about features and benefits and know the product and then present this product to us at the end of the first two weeks and you're in and you've got a six month trial and we'll see from what happens from there. Nobody really mentioned it in sales management either. and. It's now becoming very, very uh, important. Well, sorry, it's now recognised. The importance has become more recognised. Probably behind me, you can see there's three or four books by a guy called Daniel Goldman. Um, I haven't read but one of them, and one of them is just simply called Emotional Intelligence. There's another book there called Destructive Emotions, and he's given credit for drawing attention to emotional intelligence. It dates back to somewhere around 1990, mid-1990s. There were a couple of American guys who came together and he, um, I don't think he was one of the two, but I think he was the one that became most prominent in developing his theory of, the theory of emotional intelligence and the importance that it has in relationship building, but in the context of sales, how critical it is in, in selling. And it was never discussed, you know, it was never ever discussed. It doesn't have to be a 400 page book, but Breaking, breaking everything down into seeing the picture in the other person's head. How do you go about that? And for me, maybe it's because of um, kind of, I say this jokingly, growing up in this environment, but whenever you thought, think of the word question, and it's like an interrogation. It's like people used to joke, you know, it's, it's about like being in Castle Ray or it's like the Gestapo. Um, evidently it's nothing like either because those are fairly, um, but you get, you get the point. Um, I'm kind of making a point about it and that, Questioning is just a box ticking exercise that you need to force an answer to. And most of the time when you get, you're asking questions and you're not getting the answer you want, you'll ask questions that will lead you to getting what you want. Because it's what you want is to get the sale. You're not really necessarily thinking about the, the, lifetime, the lifetime value of this customer. Um, you're not thinking about... Um, no means not yet, as in it's not going to happen now, but if I do the work now, I will move forward and be able to move forward. And it's like I always talk about it, like the Dyson effect, where you're going in with a vacuum cleaner and you're sucking out as much information as you can. And then when, when, when you're back in the office, you can kind of reassemble and restructure the content to see what's there. Um, all predicated on the notion that you're not going to try and sell the, in, the, at the first, in the first attempt. But what it does mean is that at some point you really need to be 
face to face with the person and um, how the pandemic made that very difficult for people. I, I admire anybody who was able to sell um, over Zoom and uh, online and Teams and Skype and so on because some of the non-verbal communication that um, presents itself from both parties uh, is lost in that dynamic. It's, it's lost on, on, on that platform. And um, how you can see the picture in the other person's head, I think there needs to be it needs to be done in a one-to-one -one environment. Um, so I don't think about question, I think about curiosity. And I've taken the definition of curiosity from the, an online dictionary. A strong desire to learn or know something, okay? Um, it also means inquisitive thinking. So you're trying to become more of a consultant, and this is very obvious when you say that, or when I say it, it's more about a consultative approach than actually um, field sales or business development. And you need to think about a triage or a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, somebody who is a consultant to you, and they need to find out what your real problem is. And so they ask um, questions in a way um, that, that will lead you to tell them something um, but you know very quickly whether they're interested or not. And I can cite pretty much loads of examples in, um, in all of those professions. And my, I'm very lucky that I have a doctor who's genuinely curious about your life. He's, he, he, um, I get more than the six minutes and 30 seconds when I get to see him, and I'm probably blessed that that is the case. And he's a doctor that I would be very, very uh, anxious if I lost. Put it like that. He is he is curious about. He remembers stuff. He um, can join the dots. He's very very at ease. Uh, he makes you feel at ease. He's at ease. He's very kind of laid back, but he gets to the crux of it every single time, and that's really what um, a good salesperson should be. It's not about questions. How could it be about questions? Um, you know, you need to find out information. But if your approach is just to ask a list of questions, then you, you kind of get the, the answer that you deserve, I think. Um, and I'll explain that in a second, what I mean by that. So emotional intelligence um, is really about, you know, uh, self-awareness. Not first of all, but self-awareness as, as, you know, who you are. Being aware of checking in with yourself. Um, one of the previous podcasts that I ran was with um, Kevin Young. And Kevin always spoke to me about... Take time to check in with yourself just to see who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, um, it's not really a good starting point. You know, emotionally and your well-being and your preparation and, and all that stuff. You know, just take time to check in. In a world where we're under an incredible amount of pressure and the pressure from management and business owners is numbers driven usually. It's about getting the numbers in and hitting your call ratios and so on and so forth. My view has changed a lot recently, um, maybe through the pandemic or maybe before that, um, is that really it's, if you're able to do the job really well, the results on the outcome will speak for themselves and you find yourself um, in, a, in, a, in a state of flow a, at, a, at a rate, at a frequency, at a volume, at a tempo, that is really, really comfortable for you. Um, and if you're comfortable, that's a pretty good starting point for trying to engage with um, a stranger or a, uh, a prospect who is ultimately a, a, a professional stranger, if that makes sense. Um, you're talking about self-awareness, you're talking about self-regulation, you know, um, what do you do then? What are you, what are your, if you're checking in and what you see isn't good, what do you do? How do you, how do you bring yourself to the point? It's, it's set, you know, you have to keep at your job, you have to turn up. You know, kind of rule number whatever is the first five or the first ten of anything is you've got to turn up at the same page every day. Um, if you own a business and you're employing 500 people, like they, they kind of expect you to, to be on that same page every day. And if not, you're inconsistent. And if you're inconsistent, then you've got big problems. So as a salesperson or somebody in business development, you need to be checking in every single day at the right page, at the same page where you left off yesterday. So if you're not checking in, um, what do you do about that? Do, do you have any tools at, at your disposal? Have you thought about what you need to do? It's like a can of Red Bull, really, what you want to be taking first thing in the morning. Um, is 
you know, is it right just to make another call when your focus isn't in the right place, when your attitude isn't in the right place? And I'm speaking from a position of decent authority on that, you know. I, I've um, maybe struggled with that checking in thing for a long time and the self-awareness is maybe not as it should be. And um, in sales, that can... That, that, that's not good, like... You know, you, you can find yourself um, down a rabbit hole, you can find yourself distracted, you can find yourself spinning your wheels, you can find yourself going into reverse. So what are the tools that you have that you've thought about to get yourself to check in? Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that you can do, but it's an individual thing. So is it, um, are, are you mindful, are you present, are you... Do you do anything to be more present? Have you thought about the importance of the now rather than the catastrophizing or the grandiosity? Thinking about the bad things that did happen that might happen, you know, over flattering yourself with all the brilliant things you think you've done. But actually, it's not people aren't looking for brilliance; they're just looking for sort of consistently okay. Actually, sometimes being consistently okay is exactly what everybody needs. And so, how, how do you check in for that? Um, do you know the impact of that on the, the relationships? Um, you know, are you good at reading a room? Are you good at um, being able to determine the pace um, of conversation, the tone of conversation, what's okay to talk about, what's not okay to talk about? And how is this impacting um, on your short, medium, and long term? Uh, and if all you're thinking about is features and benefits and questions, like, I don't want to break it to you. Like, nobody wants a features and benefits dump. Nobody. They're just not interested. Even the person that tells you they just want the features and benefits, they don't. You know, the best advice you could give them is not to buy this service or product because it genuinely doesn't fit. But how do you know that if you're just giving them stuff that's in a brochure? That you're PowerPointing them to death with facts and features and benefits and pictures and bullet points? And one of the, one of the, the things that... that we try and get a balance on is whenever we're, we're doing presentation skills is that part of the presentation needs to be an interaction. It's not just about talking um, all of the good talk and clicking and not, but not having to look behind you and know it fluently and the content comes off as if you're a newsreader. It's not about that. The difference between a presenter and a sales presentation is that there's interaction that you have to ask some questions. You have to be able to um, ask a question at the right point to open up the discussion. The same people that told me about seeing the picture in the other person's head, they work in two entirely disconnected industries. They, they know each other and maybe they've talked about this. So it's like, get the picture in the other person's head is number one, but slow down and then open up. So the phrase like slow down and open up is one that's fairly easy to remember and it's really all about slowing down the pace of the conversation, slowing down the um, cadence, slowing down everything to a point where you're really sure of what's actually going on in the conversation and then open up. So yeah, that sounds like opening questions, but if you're genuinely curious about the customer, if you're genuinely and sincerely curious about your business and what, what outcomes and the consequences of doing business with you lead to and you're genuinely curious about establishing a relationship, it's real easy. If you're not curious about it, if all you're doing is asking questions and you want to um, pro project your figures at the end of each day or each month, say, look, well, I've done my job. You wanted 40 calls. I've done the 40. I've done this. You can hear the calls. They're real good, etc., cetera, et cetera. But you're not really finding that your heart's in it. Because curiosity and the inquisitive thinking needs to come from a place of meaning for you. You know, that's your why. You come into work every day and I like this. I want to do this. This fulfills me. Um, I want to learn more about this. Um, so sticking on a video in the evening. Jesus, a video. Sticking on a YouTube <clears throat> in the evening and um, learning, you know, a podcast or an audiobook and learning and it's not a chore. Sometimes you speak to some people in, in the sales environment and we're training and we're talking about, you know, what do you, what do you do when you're driving from home this evening? And they say, well, you know, listen to the radio, listen to news and all that. And you suggest a few podcasts and a few audiobooks and you come in about, um, you know, a month later and you ask them about it and they still haven't done it. And that's not a reflection on them. 
it's it's a question for them. It's to them to check in with themselves, to to see what, my real value in 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 a professional relationship is what what I know. Am I learning more every day? Am I um, able to grow and augment my knowledge to a point that I will be able to influence and persuade people to buy more from me? Um, <clears throat> features and benefits won't change over time. Customer value proposition doesn't really change over time. And if you're able to um, integrate a value, value propositions in your sales pitch, that's great. You know, and resonate, substantiate and differentiate, that's class. Um, but that doesn't really get under the skin of the problem or the position that your prospect has taken. You know, um, the discussion is open. They're talking to you. They're not talking to you to get out of the rain. They're talking to you because they've got something that they either overtly know needs to be fixed or they're unsure why, but they have a, an inclination that it needs fixed. Your job is to just to try and get them to reveal their their interests okay um so emotional intelligence is one of those things where it's like a real box ticking exercise sometimes um i've had to go out of my way and study it because you know i was genuinely curious about my self-awareness i was curious about how you could really impact people in training sessions um and we do a lot of work across all of the sales skills with people and the one that has the most impact is, is emotional intelligence. It's the one that people kind of um, relate to. Uh, but it's not a box ticking exercise. It's not a 30 minute session. It's not a half day session. It takes training. It takes practice. It takes rehearsal. It takes, um, you know, it takes a lot of reflection and it takes um, willing participants. You need to have a management team that are interested in growing and developing what they have in front of them. And you need to have a sales team or business development individuals that are also interested in flourishing and pursuing what, what, what their career as well. Something I want to reflect back on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in the podcast with Kevin was that um, the whole idea of compassion and the awkward discussion about trying to move people out of your business that really shouldn't be there. And we're in a climate now where people will um, be applying for jobs and business owners and employers will take people now um, that they may not have taken a few months ago or a few years ago. And that's just a statement of fact, it is what it is, but it's not the right thing. And if you've got people that are working for you, and if you are one of those people that are working for a business that just feel that it's not for you and you've been there for longer than maybe eight months or a year, it's it's okay to be to move on or to be moved on to something better. Um, but that's self-awareness. That's about you being aware that this isn't for me and I've got, I can get something better. You're not always stuck in the one place. And it shouldn't be an awkward conversation for an employer to talk about moving somebody on if they don't fit the business. Um, it's not about constructive dismissal. It's, it's about compassionately trying to say to somebody, like, you know, you can't really fake it all the time to make it. At some point, it has to become very clear that you are there's an authenticity to, to your work, that you really do buy in to what we're doing, to what we're trying to achieve. Um, and there's a self-awareness from the business as well the business has to be really clear about its value set and where it's going and the support that you give to your employees but if 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 you're turning sales into a features and benefits dump the whole time it's into the it's a production process my part chickens 33 days later checks are out new batch comes in and rinse and repeat and I don't really think sales is about that. Um, job satisfaction certainly isn't about that. Contentment, culture, um, performance improvement isn't about that. And those are things that everybody needs to think about. Um, which they think about four times a year or 12 times a month or once a week when you have meetings with your superiors and your subordinates. Um, these are the kind of things that are important to think about. I'm going to leave a few references for you. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of TED Talks. Like Daniel Goldman is, is kind of the go-to guy, Daniel Goldman's emotional intelligence. Um, he gets a lot of credit for that, but there are other resources and sources to look at that may, may make things easier for you to understand. Um, just Google Daniel Goldman. Um, <clears throat> Social intelligence is one of the books, if you can see that. Um, personally, for me, I would just go for the emotional intelligence book. Um, it's, not easily to, it's not easily read first time around, um, but it, it will make sense to you and it will probably um, change the way you think about selling because ultimately this is what these uh, podcasts are about, trying to make you think differently about how you sell. Um, and it all really boils down to the fact that this is a people business. This is about engagement with people. This is about getting your prospects offline to face to face as quickly as you can to use some of the skills that you have to understand better what's motivating their position. Why are they feeling the way they feel about buying um, or not buying? What's motivating their, their interests? What is this person like? How can I get under their skin? How can get, I get inside their head to see the picture that that they see right now? What their pain point is? Um, what it would feel like to be living in their world? What would, what would it feel like to be a buyer for Company X coming in at 9 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning staying for 12 hours buying? What is the buying process like? What motivates this thinking or her thinking? Um, what pressures and pain points would they be a enduring every single day what does the competitive landscape look like yeah you can ask all those questions you know you can ask um but you need to check in um sort of walk a mile in their shoes you know you need to check in that way rather than just asking questions i hope that makes sense um i'm going to leave you with a video the video um <clears throat> i hopefully is not going to be uh, a big copyright issue it was created by an agency in london um, I think it was BMP DDB Needham. If you're really interested in that, you can check it out. They did some work for The Guardian as recently as 1998, 1999. Maybe they're still working with The Guardian. They've done a couple of really good campaigns. This is a, the skinhead campaign that runs back from 1986 to promote the newspaper. Um, it stood out then when I first saw it. It's just an incredible piece of uh, storytelling in about 20 odd seconds. Um, but I hope it makes sense to you. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, just go and Google it. Um, the Guardian Skinhead advert, that's all you need to be uh, searching on YouTube and it will come up. I'm going to leave it here in the video and um, hopefully it will stimulate some thinking. It will maybe help you reflect on how often or how seldom you seek to view the picture in the other person's head and what you do with that information. So thanks for tuning in um, and I hopefully we'll get talking to you again.